There's one judgment by, by me speaking for uh, Brother Justice Rishikesh Roy, Justice Pardiwala, Justice Manoj Mishra, Justice Rajesh Bindal, Justice Satish Chandra Sharma, and Justice Augustine Masi. Then there is a second judgment by Sister Justice Nagaratna, which is partially concurring. And there is a dissent by Justice uh, Dulia. So I'll just read out relevant parts of my uh, judgment. The issues that arose for our consideration are A, Article 31C, whether Article 31C as upheld in Keshwan and Bharati survives in the Constitution after the amendment to the provision by the 42nd Amendment was struck down by this court in Minerva Mills, and B, Article 339B, whether the interpretation of Article 39B adopted by Justice Krishnayar in Ranganath Reddy and followed in Sanjeev Koch must be reconsidered, whether the phrase material resources of the community in Article 39B can be interpreted to include resources that are owned privately and not by the state. On the first question, we hold, and on this we are all unanimous, there is no divergence of opinion on, on the first aspect. On the first question, we hold that Article 31C, to the extent that it was upheld in Keshwan and Bharati, remains in force. After tracing the history of Article 31C and the precedents concerning the invalidation of amendments, we observe, by Section 4 of the 42nd Amendment, the words, the principles specified in clauses B or C of Article 39 in Article 31C were replaced with the words, all or any of the principles laid down in Part 4. This is a case of substitution. Section 4 of the 42nd Amendment was subsequently struck down in Minerva Mills. As noted above, when an amendment substituting certain text with certain alternate text is invalidated, the effect is that the unamended text continues in force. This is because the legislative intent of repeal and enactment in such cases is composite and cannot be separated. To give effect to the repeal and not the enactment would result in an outcome which does not correlate with legislative intent. And as Justice Hidayatullah noted in Lakshmi Bai's case, leave the original section truncated, resulting in absurd outcomes. This would, in effect, invalidate the original valid and constitutional provision, despite there being no constitutional fault with it, nor the legislative intent, legislature intending to repeal it. Thus, the presumption would be that after Minerva Mills, the unamended Article 31C would continue in force. Indeed, it is evident that such cases as Bhim Singh and Sanjeev Koch proceeded on this presumption. The only plausible exception to this presumption would be if it could be demonstrated that Parliament, when enacting the 42nd Amendment, would have repealed the words, the principles specified in Clause B or Clause C of Article 39, independent of their enactment of the words, all or any of the principles laid down in Part 4. In this case, no reference to the broader legislative proceedings or external aids is necessary to arrive at the inference that Parliament would not have independently repealed these words. The text of the amendment adopted by Parliament itself makes it abundantly clear that there was no independent intention to repeal. The effect of Section 4 of the 42nd Amendment was to expand the scope of the immunity provided by Article 31C to legislation. Under the unamended Article 31C, immunity was only provided to legislation if it gave effect to the directive principles found in Clause B or Clause C of Article 39. However, by Section 4 of the 42nd Amendment, the scope of this immunity was significantly expanded to immunize legislations that gave effect to any or all of the directive principles in Part 4 of the Constitution. Thus, the intention of Parliament in enacting Section 4 of the Constitutional Amendment was undoubtedly to expand the scope of the immunity granted by Article 31C. This being the situation, it cannot be suggested that Parliament would have repealed the words, the principles specified in Clause B or Clause C of Article 39, if it did not simultaneously enact the broader language expanding the scope of Article 31C. If Parliament had independently repealed these words, it would have not just reduced the scope of Article 31C, but altogether eliminated the effect of the article. Without the words, the principles specified in Clause B or Clause C of Article 39 and Article 31C, the provision would have been rendered negatory. <coughs> Given Parliament's manifest intention to expand the scope of Article 31C by Section 4 of the 42nd Amendment, it is not plausible to hold that Parliament independently sought to repeal the words, the principles specified in Clause B or Clause C of Article 39 from Article 31C. Therefore, it is evident that the legislative intent of Parliament when adopting Section 4 of the 42nd Amendment was composite 
to repeal and enact, that is to substitute to one single action. This, this court cannot therefore disaggregate the steps of repeal and enactment and give effect to the repeal even, while, even after invalidating the amend, enactment. After Minerva Mills invalidated Section 4 of the 42nd Amendment, the composite legal effect of Section 4 is nullified and the unamended text of Article 31C stands revived. The final question is whether the revival of the unamended text of Article 31C would in some way manifestly contravene the principles laid down in the judgment in Minerva Mills or result in some other adverse consequence. The text of the unamended Article 31C was challenged and the first part of the article was held by the 13 judge decision in Keshwan and Bharati, while the latter half of the article was invalidated. <laughs> Therefore, the first half of the unamended Article 31C, which is the subject matter of the present controversy, was undoubtedly constitutional as held by the 13 judge decision in Keshwan and Bharati and further by the constitution bench in Vaman Rao. Therefore, if as a consequence of the decision in Minerva Mills, the unamended Article 31C continues in force, there can be no question of any unconstitutionality or adverse consequences associated with the unamended Article 31C. Indeed, both the constitution benches in Minerva Mills and Vaman Rao expressly noted that the first half of Article 31C had been held to be constitutional in Keshwan and Bharati. Given that the unamended Article 31C has been given effect to for over four decades, as demonstrated by the decisions of Bhim Singh and Sanjeev Kok, no argument can be raised concerning any legal or practical difficulties with the operation of the unamended Article 31C. Given these findings, we conclude that the unamended Article 31C continues in force. On the second issue concerning Article 39B, we first look at the question of judicial propriety and discipline and then determine the correctness of the judgments which have been doubted by the reference on their merits. We observe that there is a distinction, be there is a distinction between holding that private property may form part of the phrase material resources of the community and holding that all private property falls within the net of the phrase. It is here that the judgment by Justice Krishnayar in Ranganath Reddy and the consequent observations in Sanjeev Kok fall into error. Justice Krishnayar cast the net wide, holding that all resources which meet material needs are covered by the phrase and any attempts by the government to nationalize these resources would be within the scope of Article 39B. He clarified that not only the means of production, but also the goods so produced fall within the net of the provision. The illustration which he provides on Ranganath Reddy indicates the unworkable nature of such an interpretation. Justice Krishna had observed by way of an illustration that not only do factories which produce cars fall within the net of Article 39B, but even privately owned cars are covered by the provision. Similarly, even in Sanjeev Kok, the net is cast wide. And this court observed that all things capable of producing wealth of the community fall within the ambit of the phrase. In both decisions, it was observed that all resources of the individual are consequentially the resources of the community. An interpretation of Article 39B, which places all private property within the net of the phrase material resources of the community, only satisfies one of the three requirements of the phrase. That is, that the goods in question must be a resource. However, it ignores the qualifier that they must be material and of the community. The words of the, the, the use of the words material and community are not meaningless superfluities. We cannot adopt a construction of the provision which renders these terms osures. The words of the community must be understood as distinct from the individual. If Article 39B was meant to include all resources owned by an individual, it would state that the ownership and control of resources is so distributed as best to subserve the common good. Similarly, if the provision were to exclude privately owned resources, it would state ownership and control of resources of the state instead of its current phrasing. The use of the words of the community rather than of the state indicates a specific intention to include some privately owned resources. In essence, the text of the provision indicates that not all privately owned resources fall within the ambit of the phrase. However, privately owned resources are not excluded as a class and some private resources may be covered. The resource in question must, be, must meet two qualifiers. That is, it must be a material resource, at mu it must be of the community. Thus, the judgments doubted in the reference before us are incorrect to the extent that they hold that all resources of an individual are part of the community and thus all private property is covered by the phrase material resources of the community. The interpretation amounts to endorsing 
a particular economic ideology. To declare that Article 39B includes the distribution of all private resources amounts to endorsing a particular economic ideology and structure for our economy. Justice Krishna's judgment in Ranganath Reddy, which was followed in Tunelia and Sanjeev Kok and Bhim Singhji, was influenced by a particular school of economic thought. This is evident from various observations made in these judgments. For instance, in Ranganath Reddy, Justice Krishna observed that Article 39B constitutes a directive to the state with a deliberate design to dismantle feudal and capitalist citadels of property. In Bhim Singh Ji, Justice Krishna has cited Karl Marx in his judgment to observe that taking over large conglomerations of land is necessary to make Article 39 a constitutional reality. Interestingly, in the same decision, the learned judge also expressed his view about the nature of the economy and observed that our economy was in the transitional stage undergoing a Fabian transformation. Similarly, in Sanjeev Kok, Justice Chinnaparedi stated that the words and thought of Article 39b but echo the familiar language and philosophy of socials as expounded by all socialist writers. In a sense, the interpretation of Article 39b adopted in these judgments is rooted in, is rooted in a particular economic ideology and the belief that an economic structure which prioritizes the acquisition of private property by the state is beneficial for the nation. Significantly, both Justice Krishnayar in Ranganath Reddy and Bhim Singh Ji and Justice Chinnapa Reddy in Sanjeev Kok consistently referred to the vision of the framers as the basis to advance this economic ideology as a guiding principle for the provision. However, as noted earlier in this judgment, the vision of the framers while drafting the constitution was not to lay down a particular form of social structure or economic policy for future governments. The debates in the Constituent Assembly reflect the foresight of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. He was categoric in his constitutional vision. The constitution and the directive principles as he expounded in their fundamental principles rejected the prevalence of one dogma. The constitution was framed in broad terms to allow succeeding governments to experiment with and adopt a structure for economic governance which would subserve the policies for which it owes accountability to the electorate. According to Dr. Ambedkar, if the constitution laid down a particular form of economic and social organization, it would amount to taking away the liberty of the people to decide the social organization in which they wish to live. He opined on several occasions that economic democracy is not tied to one economic structure, such as socialism or capitalism, but to the aspiration for a welfare state. That the role, thus, the role of this court is not to lay down economic policy, but to facilitate this intent of the framers to lay the foundation for an economic democracy. Indeed, it is this spirit and its all-encompassing nature of the constitution which has allowed elected governments since independence to pursue economic reforms and policies based on domestic conditions, international requirements, and political exigencies of the time. At the time of independence in the 1950s and 60s, given the earlier challenges of our republic, the focus of the government was on planning, a mixed economy, heavy industries, and import substitution policies. Subsequently, in the late 1960s and 70s, there was a shift towards purportedly socialist reforms and policies. Since the decade of the 1990s or the liberalization years, there has been a shift towards pursuing a policy of market-based reforms. Today, the Indian economy has transitioned from the dominance of public investment to the coexistence of public and private investment. The doctrinal error in the Krishnaya approach was postulating a rigid economic theory which advocates for greater state control over private resources as the exclusive basis for constitutional governance. India's economic trajectory indicates that the constitution and the custodians of the constitution, the electorate, have routinely rejected one economic dogma as being the exclusive repository of truth. As participants in a vibrant, multi-party economic democracy, the people of India have voted to power governments which have adopted varied economic and social policies based on the country's evolving development strategies and challenges. The foresighted vision of our framers to establish an economic democracy and trust the wisdom of the elected government has been the backbone of the high growth rate of India's economy, making it one of the fastest growing economies in the world. To scuttle this constitutional vision by imposing a single economic theory, which views the acquisition of private property by the state as the ultimate goal, would undermine the very fabric and principles of our constitutional framework. We therefore conclude a Article 31C to the extent that it was upheld in Keshwan and Bharti versus Union of India 
versus uh, remains in force. B, the majority judgment in Ranganath Reddy expressly distanced itself from the observations made by Justice Krishnayar, speaking on behalf of the minority of judges on the interpretation of Article 39B. Thus, a co-equal bench of this court in Sanjeev Kok uh, erred by relying upon the minority opinion. C, the single sentence observation in Mafatlal to the effect that material resources of the community include privately owned resources is not part of the ratio of decedenda of the judgment, thus it is not binding on this court. D. The direct question referred to this bench is whether the phrase material resources of the community used in Article 39B includes privately owned resources. Theoretically, the answer is yes. The phrase may include privately owned resources. However, this court is unable to subscribe to the expansive view adopted in the minority judgment authored by Justice Krishnayar in Ranganath Reddy and subsequently relied on this by this court in Sanjeev Kok. Not every resource owned by an individual can be considered a material resource of the community merely because it meets the qualifier of material needs. E. The inquiry about whether the resource in question falls within the ambit of Article 39B must be contest specific and subject to a non-exhaustive list of factors such as the nature of the resource and its characteristics, the impact of the resource on the well-being of the community, the scarcity of the resource, and the consequences of such a resource being concentrated in the hands of private players. The public trust doctrine evolved by this court may also help identify resources which fall within the ambit of the phrase material resource of the community. F, the term distribution has a wide connotation. The various forms of distribution which can be adopted by the state cannot be exhaustively detailed. However, it may include the vesting of the concerned resources in the state or nationalization. In the specific case, the court must determine whether the distribution subserves the common good. The reference is answered in the above terms. The registry is directed to obtain administrative instructions from the Chief Justice for placing the matters before an appropriate bench. Flexible interpretation must be given, which the changing times require. Neither can there be canonization of the socialist policy followed by the state, nor can the principles akin to laissez-faire economics be ignored at a time when they have been resurrected by the state itself to suit the developments of the economy in the country and for the benefit of the people of India. Chief Justice Earl Warren's statement is apposite and as a reminder to our judicial conscience. Quote, our judges are not monks nor scientists, but participants in the living stream of our national life, steering the law between the dangers of rigidity on the one hand and the formlessness of the other. Our system faces no theoretical dilemma, but a single continuous problem. How to apply the ever-changing conditions, the never-changing principles of freedom? Can principles of liberalization, privatization, and globalization adopted in India since the year 1991, reforms in the economy, and structural changes that have been brought about in these last three decades, Hold a mirror against the socio-economic policies that were followed in the decades immediately after India attained independence. As a result, can the judgments of this court which interpreted the constitution to be compatible with the policies of the state then be considered to be a disservice to the broad and flexible spirit of the constitution and the authors of the said judgment being critiqued today? I have perused the erudite and comprehensive opinion authored by Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Dr. Dhananjaya Vai Chandrachut, on the questions referred to this nine judge bench. I have also perused the opinion proposed by learned brother Justice Dulia. The letter and spirit of the judgment of the learned Chief Justice has ignited me to pen a separate opinion, concurring with his opinion on certain issues while giving my own views on certain other aspects which is also my response to learned brother Justice Dhulia's views. How does ownership and control of material resources privately owned transform into the material resources of the community for distribution as best to subserve the common good? This is the thrust of my opinion. The learned Chief Justice has framed and considered two broad issues which have been read. I respectfully concur with the opinion expressed by the learned Chief Justice on the first issue. Before dealing with the second issue, I would like to preface the same with the living tree doctrine of our constitution. As per Woodrow Wilson, former president of the United States of America, 
A constitution must of necessity be a vehicle of life, that its substance is the thought and habit of the nation, and as such it must grow and develop as the life of the nation changes." Unquote. In Anwar Ali Sarkar, Justice Vivian Bose in a separate judgment stated that the provisions of the constitution must not be interpreted without regard to the background out of which they arose. Justice Bose articulated that the constitution must be interpreted progressively to give life to a great nation and order its being and not in a manner as would relaunch discarded tools. While being conscious that people who forget their history are condemned to repeat it, he emphasized that the constitution must be interpreted having regard not only to the historical circumstances under which it emerged, but also in a manner as would mold the future as well as guide the present. Justice Krishnayar adjudicated on the construction of material resources of the community in the backdrop of a constitutional economic and social culture that gave privacy to the state over the individual in a broad sweeping manner. As a matter of fact, the 42nd Amendment had in Italia inserted the word socialist into the preamble to the constitution. Can we castigate former judges and allege them with disservice only for reaching a particular interpretive outcome? It is a matter of concern as to how the judicial brethren of posterity view the judges of the brethren of the past, possibly by losing time, sight of the times in which the latter discharged their duties and the socio-economic policies that were pursued by the state and form part of the constitutional culture during those times. Merely because of the paradigm shift in the economic policies of the state, privatization and liberalization and privatization, compendiously called the reforms of 1991, which continue to do so till date, cannot result in branding the judges of this court of the yesteryears as doing a disservice to the constitution. At the outset, I may say that such observations emanating from this court in subsequent times creates a concavity in the matter, manner of, of voicing opinions on judgments of the past and their authors by holding them doing a disservice to the Constitution of India and thereby implying that they may not have been true to their oath of office as a judge of the Supreme Court of India. Bearing in mind the goals of the Constitution as enumerated in the directive principles of state policy, Parliament and state legislatures have made legislation for giving effect to such goals and since the inception of our republican state it is the obligation on the part of this court to consider the correctness of such legislation in light of the vision of the favors of the constitution as well as the transformative nature of the indian constitution and the intent of the policy makers and the law it is in the above background that judges of this court have been deciding constitutional cases over the decades of course no particular line of thinking is static and changes are brought about by the state by bearing in mind the exigencies of the times and global impact, particularly on Indian economy. Such attempts to create an environment suitable to the changing times have to be appreciated by the judiciary, of course, by suitably interpreting the constitution and the laws. But by there being a paradigm shift in the economy of the country, akin to perestroika in the erstwhile USSR, in my view, Neither the judgments of the previous decades nor the judges who decided those cases can be said to have done a disservice to the Constitution. The answer lies in the obligation that this court in particular and the Indian judiciary in general has in meeting the newer challenges of the times by choosing only that part of the past wisdom which is apposite for the present without decrying the past judges. I say so lest the judges of posterity ought not to follow the same practice. I say that the institution of the Supreme Court of India is greater than individual judges who are only a part of it at different stages of history of this great country. Therefore, I do not concur with the observations of the learned Chief Justice in the proposed judgment referred to above. I say so for the following narration. In paragraph 229, his lordship, the Chief Justice, has given his uh, conclusions. My opinion relates to conclusions in subparas D, E, and F. And I am also stating a few uh, observations, making a few observations on Raghunatha Reddy, Sanjeev Kok, Abu Kaurbai, and Basanti Pai. 
My immediate answer to the aforesaid conclusions is that material resources can in the first instance be divided into base, two basic categories, namely state-owned resources and privately-owned resources. There can be no contra-opinion to the fact that all state-owned resources, that is resources which belong to the state, are essentially material resources of the community which are held in public trust by the state. However, with regard to the material resources which belong to the private owners, how do such resources get qualified as material resources of the community? In my view, a privately owned material resource can be transformed and can indeed acquire a status of material resource of the community. What are the material resources owned by a private person which can be material resources of the community? In my view, they would not include what can be termed as personal effects of an individual, such as mobiles in the form of an individual's apparel, household articles of daily use and need, such as furniture, personal jewelry, kitchenware, and such other articles. These are articles which are of daily need and use. Then I've given what is the meaning of personal effects. This would generally mean such tangible property as is worn or carried about the person, or the designate articles associated with the person as property having more or less intimate relation to a person or possessor of such tangible property as attend. This is what Mr. Rakesh Dwivedi has argued, and I agree. However, I must elaborate on the proposed judgment on the legal distinction between how a private resource qualifies as one of the community and how such a resource is subsequently distributed to subserve the common good. It is on this crucial point that I have penned my separate opinion. Then the five fact, uh, features of Article 39B, his Lordship, the Chief Justice, has extracted. I have elaborated on that. How do material resources which are privately owned become material resources of the community? The answer to this question lies, lies in the legal devices that are adopted by the state to transform private material resources into material resources of the community. This could be in Italia in the following five ways, which are illustrative and not exhaustive in nature. One, by nationalization. Two, by acquisition. Three, by operation of law, such as vesting of private resources in the state. Four, by purchase of material resources from private persons. And five, by the owner of the material resource converting as a material resource of the community by donation, gift, creation of an endowment or a public trust. What is the common denominator in the methods adopted by the state for converting private material resources into material resources of the community? In all these three devices at one, two, and three above, what is of significance is that when, by a process of nationalization, acquisition, or vesting of private resources in the state occurs, there are certain legal processes which take place. The first process is to convert the private resource into a resource of the community by vesting in the state. And the second process is to utilize these community resources for the purpose of distribution for the common good. Distribution could be in two ways. Firstly, by actual distribution to the deserving and eligible persons as per the policy to be implemented. Second, the state could retain ownership and or control having regard to the nature of the resources and other relevant factors. The third process is that the private owners of these resources are fairly compensated when they lose all rights, title, and possession over such resources when it becomes a material resource of the community. Then I have gone into the uh, details of Ranganatha Reddy, then Bhim Singh Ji in Sanjeev Kok. I'll say a few words on Sanjeev Kok and later Basanti Bai. In Sanjeev Kok, in this case, the constitution bench arrived at its conclusions on the validity of the Coking Coal Mines Nationalization Act 1972 and upheld the same. But while doing so in paragraphs 10 to 14, Observations were made with regard to the judgment of this court in Minerva Mills. In fact, paragraph 10 reads as follows, quote, we have some misgivings about the Minerva Mills decision, despite its rare beauty and persuasive rhetoric, unquote. In my view, those observations were wholly unnecessary 
as they lose sight of the outstanding judicial statesmanship exemplified by in the majority judgment authored by Justice Y. V. Chandrachur, Chief Justice in Minerva Mills. One has to bear in mind the fact that the hearings in the case of Minerva Mills as well as in Vaman Rao were proceeding contemporaneously but before different benches, both headed by learned Y. V. Chandrachur, Chief Justice. Realizing the import of the separate opinion of Justice Krishnayar in Ranganatha Reddy and the likelihood of the said opinion gaining momentum in Minerva Mills as well as in Norman Rao, and rightly so, the then learned Chief Justice took upon himself the responsibility of pronouncing the operative portion of the judgment in Minerva Mills in May 1980 and supplementing the reasons in July 1980. And the judgment in Vaman Rao was delivered in November 1980, just prior to the retirement or demitting office of Krishnaya J. It is another matter that Justice Bhagwati frowned upon such a strategy adopted in Minerva Mills and in fact penned a common separate judgment in Minerva Mills and Vaman Rao, although the issues were distinct, though overlapping in certain areas, which were minority opinions. In Vaman Rao, only a short order was passed by Justice Bhagwati. Justice A. N. Sen, by his concurring judgment, however, opined that since there was a review of the judgment in Minerva Mills pending before this court, he refrained from dealing with the said decision and from making any observations or comments on the same. This is with regard to the interplay between Minerva Mills and Sanjeev Ko. Basanti Bhai, in this court, in this case, the court considered the correctness of the judgment of the Bombay High Court by which the High Court had declared subsections 3 and 4 of the MADA as void and had given certain ancillary directions. This court at the outset proceeded to observe in para 13 of the judgment as, quote, we shall proceed to test the validity of the argument, keeping aside for the time being the observation in Sanjeev Coke Manufacturing Company versus Bharat Coke Coal Limited. The question whether an act is intended to secure the objects contained in Article 39B or not does not depend upon the declaration by legislature, but depends on its, con on its contents. Reference was made to Ranganatha Reddy, which dealt with the question whether nationalization of bus transport was covered by Article 39B and to Justice Krishna's observations only in a limited way. It was observed that MADA was protected from challenge owing to the applicability of Article 31C of the Constitution, and it was immune from the challenge at Articles 14, 19, and 31 of the Constitution. It was further observed that land sealing laws, laws providing for acquisition of land, for providing housing accommodation, laws imposing sealing on urban property, etc., cannot be struck down by invoking Article 21 of the Constitution. Consequently, the judgment of the High Court was set aside to the extent that subsections 3 and 4 or sections 44 MADA had been held unconstitutional and struck down and the appeal was allowed. What is significant about the judgment in Basanti Bhai is firstly, the case was considered in light of only that portion of the judgment of Justice Krishnaya, which dealt with the aspect of distribution and did not discuss other aspects of Justice Krishnaya's opinion, which dealt with the judgment, which dealt with the question where even private property can be equated as material resources of the community. Secondly, in this judgment, it has been expressly stated that to test the validity of MADA, the observations of this court in Sanjeev Kaur were to be kept aside. Justice Venkatramaya, who is the author of the judgment in Basanti Bhai and a member of the high judge bench in Sanjeev Kaur, distanced himself from the observations made by Chinnapred DJ in Sanjeev Kaur as well as the other observations of Krishnaya J in Ranganatha Reddy. However, what is common in all these cases is the fact that nationalization of contract carriages in Ranganatha Reddy, nationalization of coal mines in Sanjeev Co, and reservation of land for public amenities under MADA were all upheld and sustained on the touchstone of Article 39B and protected from attack by virtue of Article 31C. While Justice Krishna, Justices Krishnayan and Chinnapreddy supported their reasoning on the touchstone of the word socialist in the preamble of the, of the Constitution, Justice Venkatramaya and Basanti Bhai considered the validity of MADA, rehorsed the observations made by Justice Chinnapreddy in Sanjeev Ko, 
and selected only certain portions of separate opinion of Justice Krishnayar in Raghunath Reddy. Thus, this court was able to consider the validity of MADA on the strength of Articles 39B, read with Articles 31C, without taking note of many of the observations in Raghunath Reddy and no observation in Sanjeev Ko made by India for by the learned judges on the basis of their socialist philosophy and on socialism. Vasanti Ba is a judgment which was delivered in the year 1986 when perestroika was taking place even in a country such as United Union of Social Soviet Socialist Republic, the home to socialism. And there was also a beginning of a new thinking in India too, commencing with five technological missions leading to the reforms of 1991, which I have discussed in the earlier part of my opinion. Then I have given my uh, some because it's a, as usual, my judgment is very long. Therefore, for a clearer understanding, I have given a, a summary of my conclusions and my views of to the conclusions of the Honorable the Chief Justice. As already said, I'm agreeing in the first part and I've elaborated on the second part. Then I say what is significant is that the judgments in Raghunath Reddy as well as in Sanjeev Ko upheld the respective nationalization acts. Therefore, on merits, it cannot be held that Sanjeev Koch violated judicial discipline. One cannot lose sight of the fact that in Sanjeev Koch, this court did not decide the case only on the basis of the opinion of Justice Krishnayar in Raghunath Reddy, but on merits on the validity of the Nationalization Act. Therefore, Sanjeev Koch is good law in so far as the merit of the matter is concerned. And I have said, uh, privately owned resources except personal effects as explained above can come within the scope and ambit of the phrase material resources of the community provided such resources get transformed as resources of the community as discussed above to it, reiterate it would not include personal effects as discussed might be in paragraph 7.6 in my view the judgments of this court in Ranganatha Reddy, Sanjeev Ko Abu Kaurbai and Basanti Bai correctly decided the issues that fell for consideration and do not call for interference on the merits of the matter as explained above. The observations of certain judges in those decisions would not call for any critique in the present times, neither is it justified nor warranted. Reference is answered in the above terms. I, uh, I must place on record my sincere appreciation to the learned attorney general learned solicitor general and their teams, learned senior counsel and learned counsel appearing for the respective parties and learned instructing counsel for their valuable assistance to this bench. Thank you. Immensely grateful. Totally agree with the view of the learned chief justice. And as far as uh, the application of Mafatlal is concerned, I again agree. Uh, Mafatlal is in the nature of an arbiter and it's not applicable. The third is regarding uh, regarding judicial discipline, about which a lot has been said, both uh, not being followed in Ranganath Reddy as well as in, in Chinnapa Reddy's, Chinnapa Reddy's judgment in Sanjeev Kok. Now, to that, I totally disagree for the reasons which I'll just state in few words. The question now is that when in Sanjeev Kok, the five judge constitution bench unanimously followed the minority judgment in Raghunath Reddy. Did it violate judicial discipline of not following the majority? But the minority decision, in my opinion, it did not break any judicial discipline. Since in Sanjeev Ko, the five judges did not go against the law laid down by the majority judges in the Raghunath Reddy, but only adopted the logic of the three judges on which the majority of four judges was silent. It is first difficult for me to even come to the conclusion that the four judges in Ranganath Reddy entirely disagreed with the minority opinion of Justice Krishna here. It merely says, we must not be understood to agree with all that he has said in his judgment in this regard. This is not exactly a disagreement. The majority of the four judges chose to remain silent on the subject. It cannot be said that the four judges in any way said anything contrary or in opposition to what was laid down by the three judges in Ranganath Reddy. 
Therefore, no judicial discipline was broken by Justice Ochinappa Reddy when he authored the unanimous judgment in Sanjeev Kok by adopting the logic of the three judges in Ranganath Reddy. The logic, however, is now very clear. In cases where a judge or judges of the Supreme Court in minority has given a decision on a point on which the majority has remained silent, that it would be binding upon the high courts and all the other courts. And for this court, at least, it will have persuasive value. The five learned judges in Sanjeev Kok relied upon the decision of the minority judges in Ranganath Reddy as they were persuaded by the logic and the interpretation given by Justice Krishna here to the phrase material resources of the community. Now, regarding the main question which was there before us, that whether privately owned resources are a part of the material resources of the community, I totally agree with the, with the findings which have been given by the by in, in Raghunath Reddy and reiterated in Sanjeev Kok. And for this, I'll just, uh, um, there is a there is an expression which is attributed to uh, Justice uh, Louis Brandes of Supreme Court, although he never said it in any of his opinion. And this is, he said that we may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few. But we cannot have both. Now, this is expression finds reflection in our Article 38 and 39 as well, on which the, my judgment is based. I am of the firm view, unrelenting opinion, that the, the interpretation given by the three judges in Ranganath Reddy and adopted unanimously by the, by the unanimous judgment in Sanjeev Kohl is the correct interpretation of material resources of the community for the reasons. The meaning which must be given to material resources of the community is what has been given to it in Ranganath Reddy by the three judges and what has been followed by the Constitution Bench decision in Sanjeev Kok. To my mind, this has been the correct interpretation of the phrase uh, material resources of the community. To reiterate what was said by Justice Krishna here in Ranganath Reddy, Material resources of the community in the context of reordering of natural economy embraces all the national wealth, not merely natural resources, all the private and public sources of meeting material needs, not merely public possession. Everything of value or use in the material world is material resource, and the individual being a member of the community, his resources are part of the, those of the community. This for the legislature to decide how the ownership and control of material resources is to be distributed in order to subserve common good. Once the expansive meaning of material resources of the community is determined, there is no necessity of drawing further guidelines for the legislature to determine as to what will constitute material resources. How to control and distribute a material resource is also the task of the legislature. But while doing so, what has to be seen is that the control and ownership of the material resources be so distributed that it subserves common good of the community. If it does not, then such a legislation can be struck down as the judiciary is not deprived of its powers of judicial review. The legislation is established a nexus with the principles specified in Article 39 B and C to be a valid legislation.